Lentner will tell us about vertex algebras with big center and a Kajdan listed correspondence. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation and for this organizing these uh, several weeks, which which I enjoy very much. So to be together again with the, the people and talk and so on. It's a very, very good feeling. Um, yeah, so this is a joint work with Boris Fagan on, on vertex algebras with Big Center. And um, I thought how to summarize this. And maybe the, the best summary I could think of was uh, the following quote by William Bush, which says, uh, as soon as you get a wish fulfilled, uh, it gets many children. So maybe that's something that we do in mathematics anyhow pretty often, um, and it's especially true, I think, for this topic. Uh, so we we know kastan lustig correspondence between a quantum group and a vertex algebra, and then we have the semi non semi simple version, which I like very much, and many people here like very much. And now you want to go a little bit further, so you want to somehow get get a correspondence of twisted modules, and that's basically the content of the talk. So let's start with introducing all the main players. So uh, we have several talks on braided tensor categories so a braided tensor category is uh, some abelian category so i assume it to be non-semi-simple so for me the important inputs or outputs are simple objects some indecomposables and what are the projective objects so that's the abelian structure but then there's also some tensor product some unit object some associativity and some way of switching the tensor products so or some commutativity and there's also a notion of dual objects which i don't use in this talk so i will not go into and um so the typical thing is what's called braiding is, of course, that if you switch M and N one time and you switch it a second time, then this double braiding is usually not trivial. And that's not a bug, it's a feature. So, so actually we want cases where this is maximally non-trivial in a sense that there is no object that has a trivial double braiding with all other objects. And this is what we call a modular tensor category. So in, in particular, I am very interested in uh, non-semi-simple modular tensor categories, which maybe came a little bit later. and. Uh, so this is, a, and of course, some things become more complicated. So instead of summing over simple objects, you have to use a co-end. And uh, this is something I was exposed, of course, very much in Hamburg and with Christoph Schweigert, as you can imagine. So I think this is a, a, good, a good framework in which you, in which you can, can sort of work in, in a similar spirit, but it's, of course, more complicated. And uh, so let's go to the easiest examples. So, of course, you all know representations of a group. If I have two representations of a group, I can tensor them and I can act on the tensor product by acting on, on both tensor factors simultaneously. Similarly, if I have modules of the Lie algebra, I can take the tensor product of these modules and I can act with a Leibniz rule. So one time on the left side, one time on the right side. And uh, these both become good tensor categories and they are all braided, basically because this assignment is symmetric, it's left and right the same, so you can just take the trivial braiding. But that's of course a braiding where the double braiding is trivial. So maybe that's not the kind of examples we want. But it's the guiding examples that we have. So then we we go to quantum groups. We want to deform this now to make this braiding non-trivial, and that's something we have we have also seen several times. So let G be a semi-simple finite-dimensional complex Lie algebra. Then we define the quantum group. So that's essentially the universal enveloping of the Lie algebra. But we fiddle in some Q, with some some deformation parameter. It's a formal parameter for now. And if you look at the representations of this, you get a semi-simple category, semi-simple tensor category, and the braiding is very non-trivial. This has appeared in several talks before. And now one further step, if you want to become non-semi-simple, what Lustig did, um, you can choose Q to be a root of unity of some order. Let's now assume it's not divisible by two and three. Um, then you have different ways how to specialize to this value of Q, but one of those specializations um, contain a very big central subalgebra, which is equal to the algebra of functions on the Lie group. Um, and if you look at the quotient of this big central subalgebra, you get a small quantum group, which is a finite dimensional, non semi simple Hopf algebra, and you get its representations a non semi simple, finite braided tensor category, which is modular in the non semi simple sense. So <clears throat> the picture we should have in mind for this talk is maybe so, so you, have, you have sort of this. this uh, big place which we call which we call the Lie group G and somehow the category if you have this big central subalgebra the category fibers over this group G so there is maybe the identity and here are all representations on which the center x trivial right with central subalgebra x trivial and inside there is basically representations of the small quantum group but then there's also other fibers right and this whole category sort of fibers over fibers over this variety and uh, so I said we should assume that the order is not divisible by two and three. So if the order is divisible by, by two or three, depending on the cases, then things become more weird. 
Um, and there has been this uh, quasi Hopf algebra on the market nowadays, which actually I thought Chris will talk about um, before me. So, so it's um, um, from the from the Verdes algebra side, you, you you guess that there is also some modular tensor category around. But this was, I think, not known for some time. And then uh, Ganodinov, Runkel, and Kreuzig, and then later me and Ganodinov and some PhD student Tobias Orman, um, and then Chris Negron in some other way. Uh, worked out how a quasi Hopf algebra, so Hopf algebra with associator, should look like, which again gives you really a modular tensor category. And I will explain this more in the lectures next week. Um, so there is like a, a, you have to a little bit make a variant, but then you again get a quasi Hopf algebra which has the right representation theory. And of course, in this case, you should again have a picture like this, but I think this is not completely worked out. So I should say that that uh, Rachetikin and Blanchet and other people have worked. Um, a lot on, on, on this, also in this context, it has to do with maybe what I'm saying. Um, so th there is work on this, but I think it's not completely settled. So I think one, one should have a picture like this for these divisible cases. Um, because it, here, of course, you now want this quasi hop algebra. But maybe that's a technicality that we can split, split on. Yeah, so this is now one source where we get very non trivial, non semi simple modular tensor categories. How do they look like? Just as an example, so SL2 at a two piece root of unity, it will have certain irreducibles. So they basically look like irreducibles from a Lie algebra, but only up to a certain dimension, right? Only up to P. And then there is no more simples. Um, and then you have projectives which look like a diamond. So there is a, a, a sub module and then, and then two quotient modules. And then at the top, there is another quotient module. And this is how the projectives look like. Um, and the tensor product look basically like a klebsch gordon rule for the Lie algebra. But as soon as your weights sort of go out of the fundamental alcove, as soon as the sum of your weights becomes larger than P, um, instead of having simples, you have projectives appear. So actually, the situation is very close to the Lie algebra in kind of characteristic. And that's actually where Lustig's intuition, as far as I know, comes from. So you have the same thing. If you have uh, highest weight representations and your, your weight grows higher than the characteristic of the ground field, then, then it's clear that things get messy. And that's exactly what they do. Yes, so another source of modular tensor categories that we've seen several times in, in, in talks is uh, vertex operator algebra. So I'll be very brief on them. So very roughly, I would imagine it's a commutative algebra. So that's my way of thinking about it, a commutative algebra where the multiplication somehow depends on a free variable Z as Laurent series. So you have two elements and you can put them together and you get a Laurent series decorated with coefficients, again, elements in this V. And it's, I say, commutative algebra, meaning commutativity and necessity hold only up to sort of formal delta functions, which, which are somehow the non-trivial part of the theory. And the second datum, there is a compatible action of the Vera solo algebra, which should be sort of, uh, if you act on V and on V and on the variable set by conformal transformations, then that should be uh, compatible with that. And L0 in particular gives you this braiding that is always present, and L minus one gives you a derivation, people call translation operator. So that's sort of the, the setting. And once you have a structure like this, basically from the way I, I write it, I think it's quite suggestive how you would look, how a module should look like. So a module is now just something where V can act on some module M and you get a result in M, but again, everything depends on Z. And there is complicated uh, conditions which are important to study, but which we can just, for now on this level of rigor, just forget. I mean, there is conditions that say basically that this should be again associative up to delta functions. And a, 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 a very great theorem says that if there is certain finiteness assumptions, uh, so if the vertex algebra is what's called C2 confinite, then the representation category is in fact a braided tensor category. And the braiding comes from the fact that you have certain intertwining operators and they are multivariate analytic functions. And, and from, the, from the analytic continuation around zero is basically where the braiding comes from. So it's a very analytical object actually. And if the representation category is semi-simple and the unit is self-dual, then it's a modular. Tensor category again. This is probably true in some sense in the non semi simple case, but there's no proof there. So I will also talk about this in the lectures much more. So this is our second object to get to get representations, uh, modular tensor category representations. And now let's go into the following notion. So now suppose that a group acts on a vertex algebra as automorphisms. Then what you can introduce is the notion of a so called G twisted module. So for every element G in the automorphism group. And what it is, is basically, again, a module. So V tensor M goes to M, but now it doesn't depend on Z as a power series with integral powers, but it depends on Z as a power series with maybe real or even complex powers. So there can be a square root Z and there can be logarithms. So this is then a regular singularity at zero. And these functions that you're talking about are multi-valued functions, right? 
So, so this curly bracket Z and log Z really means a multi-valued function on, on the punctured disk. And so, so now it's not a single valued function anymore, but now you want this not to be arbitrary, which would be an intertwiner in some sense, in some sense it would be an intertwiner, um, but, but you want this, this monotony around zero to be controlled by the action of G. So the defining equation is more or less that if you act with G on the element A um, before you act it, it's the same as if you just act with A, but you take Z and you continue it one time around the singularity. So you end up in some other part of your cover. Um, so I write e to the two pi i by indicating that. So, so if z is there, and then e to the two pi i, z is like one, one, one sheet up. So you, you walk one time around. You can also write this down in terms of power series if you want. And the typical application, which is not going to be for us the application, but why people study this is when you have such g-twisted modules, you can restrict the vertex algebra to the vertex algebra of fixed points, so the orbifold, and there those are usual modules. And you can study how they decompose, and typically that's how you get all simple modules for the fixed point VOA. So they, some of them come from modules of the VOA and some of them come from twisted points. Of the VOA. So that's the, that's the VOA things I, I want to introduce. And the corresponding categorical structures that you have is um, that of a G crossed category. So what we now have is you have the category C0, but then some other categories, CG for every G of G twisted modules. And you have a tensor product that goes from the G-twisted modules times the H-twisted modules to the G-H-twisted modules. And the G-action conjugates. So an H-twisted module becomes an G-H-G minus one-twisted module. And there's also braiding. But again, if you braid, then you get some conjugation. That's what's called the G-cross category. And uh, there's a big theorem, uh, which I find very, very helpful for a given semi-simple modular tensor category with a G action, then these extensions are in essence unique. So they are unique up to an element in H3 of the group. I think there's a C star missing. It should be like that. Yes, please. There was a question. G is finite or discrete or? Oh, so here, the, here G is finite. So thanks, yes, sure. So um, yes, so we will have now non-finite G, but uh, then we don't have this theory. Yes, exactly. But in finite G, that's the, that's the main theory. And there's also a lot of work of uh, Cesar Galindo, for example, by this. And I think McRae, as far as I know, has proven for certain class of vertex algebras that you really get this structure. So the G-twisted mod G twisted modules sort of are what, what we have here. Good. So that's the structure we have. And uh, let's go quickly to some examples of vertex algebras, which have been... Yes, please. Uh, Sorry? To say, uh, so, so for one of these examples, we you get such a structure. What is the functor G in the On second? On this slide? Yeah. It goes from H-twisted modules to conjugate twisted modules. Well, you act with G oh, just, uh, on just the element. Twisting by that. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. sure. Sorry. Yeah. That's the categorical action. That's like uh, pre-composing with, uh, with the automaton. Very good, thanks. Um, yeah. Yes. So let's now look at a couple of examples. So the one that has been on the blackboard, I think five or six times is you have an affine Lie algebra. So you have a Lie algebra and you add this uh, at this uh, generators a n for every n, and then you have some some uh, commutation relation, which is basically like 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 yeah, you just add the, the 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 indices, but then you have some central extension, which is basically the central charge and uh, the sorry the level kappa, kappa, and this gives you some vertex algebra which you can study. It has highest weight modules and so on. And many people have talked about it, and then you can do a quantum Hamiltonian reduction, and this gives you another vertex algebra W kappa. Which in the special case of SL2 is just a Veros photo algebra. And that's basically the case we will mostly talk about. So these are the two VUAs that play a role in this talk. And uh, now, now a conjecture, which is called logarithmic Katalustic conjecture, says the following. So there should be, for every Lie algebra and for every natural number, there should be an extension of this W algebra, which has the following form. So so you have modules over the W algebra, and here this is a finite representation of this Lie algebra. So this is really the, the highest weight representation of lambda, the irreducible of the Lie algebra G, the finite Lie algebra. So there's a one, one copy of W, and then there is two copies of W, or maybe three copies of W and five copies, and, and there's SL2 acting on these uh, copies, these multiplicity spaces. So there's a, the conjecture that there exists a, Lie, a, a, a vertex algebra like that, which you should be able to construct as kernel of screenings, whatever that is. I will explain this in the, in the lectures a little bit more, such that as braided tensor categories, the representation category of this should be the same as the small quantum group. 
that's the logarithmic cushion of stiff conjecture. It's somehow the non semi simple version of the cushion of stiff conjecture. And, um, and uh, so for SL2, this is, has been known as a triplet algebra. So this algebra was known before. And the general case, I think we call the Fagin Tipunin algebra, because it was introduced in this Fagin Tipunin paper. And um, I think many people have worked on this. Um, and for, for SL2, this conjecture was finally proven um, by the work of many authors. So I think of the people present. So there's uh, most certainly Azad Ganulinov, who, who worked on this from the beginning. And then there is a work by, by, by Mr. Chia Wood. Um, and then uh, Thomas, me, and uh, 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 um, Matt Rupert, uh, a postdoc, I think at this time PhD student, and on the other hand, uh, Terry Gannon and Chris Negron uh, sort of made, made final steps on this, so they were smarter than us, they made arbitrary p, we just had p equals two, um, but so it was a long, long list where you first fix the abelian category, and then you start calculating fusion products, and then, and, then, and then rigidity is a big topic, and then at, some, at the end you somehow fix the associators and fix that you have an equivalence of tensor category, so this is a and for, for higher G, I think it's still very complicated. So many of these pieces miss. We, we don't even know the simple modules, maybe, or something. Um, although there is this, uh, this uh, great work by uh, Sugimoto, where I think many of these things are, are put one big step forward. So I think we should use this technology more. So for, for P, let me just add, because I will talk in the lectures about the screening operators generate actually Nichols algebra, UQ plus, so the positive part of this quantum group. So you somehow see on the physics side that this quantum group appears. Um, that is work when I first met met Fagan in uh, Moscow. Um, so, so let's now look at let's now look at this vertex algebra. Yeah, please. Is is the first half of the conjecture known? Like that there exists this thing and it's constructed as kernel of screenings? No, no. I mean, you can. Well, let's say you can write down kernel of screenings. And probably, I think, but now I'm speculating, with this work of Sugimoto, I think you can write down characters. So you, in principle, know the decomposition like this. But you, you'll not even know that it's C2 component, maybe. So you don't even know you have a tensor category, for example. Or you don't, maybe nothing know about which modules you have. I mean, you have some you can write down, but whether those are all was done very differently for triplets. So this is Adamovich Miller's paper. So they computed the two algebra just by hand. So there's, we have no clue how to do that in general G case, so on. Yeah. Um, so, and, and now maybe the first question that is content of this talk is, uh, we now have an action of, so supposedly we have an action of G on this triplet algebra. The same way we have an action of G categorically on the small quantum group. So the natural thing that one should ask is, what are the twisted modules? So what are the twisted modules of triplet algebra or fagin tipulin algebra? How do they look like for every G in the Lie group? So now, of course, we're in a situation where G is a finite group, but G is a Lie group. It's the Lie group associated to G. And um, what, what we propose is uh, you can use what we call a twisted free field realization. So I, I do this rather, rather briefly, but um, because it's not the main part of my talk, but, but we need it for comparing later. So what you do is you, you choose a Borel part that contains your Lie algebra element or Lie group element G. And then there is always, there's many free field realizations which you can get triplet from. There is one um, on, which, on which G is acting. So the one in the right direction somehow, the one that belongs to this model. And so in this, you have an action of G on the free field realization. And now on the free field realization, it's an inner automorphism because it comes from a so-called long screening. And there is this notion that as soon as you have inner automorphisms, you can somehow produce twisted modules by deforming this delta deformation. And then you restrict them back to the small quantum, to the, to the triplet algebra. So that's a way how to produce twisted modules on the, on the, uh, in algebra. And, and not all twisted models arise in this way. And in these examples I will show you, we have explicitly computed all twisted modules. And in particular, we see that all the simple modules come from there. And also some in decomposables, but not the projectors. So, so that is the, the first thing we want to do. So now we have a, a correspondence between a vertex algebra and a quantum group. And we ask the question, what are the twisted modules on the vertex algebra side? So now we get a G crossed category. We get something like this, right? And now the main question is now, do we find a vertex algebra that is an analogon to this big center quantum group? So is there a very, very big vertex algebra with a central subalgebra, which fibers like this? And this is more complicated. And uh, let me look how the time is. Maybe that's what we talk now a little bit more slowly about. Yes, plenty of time, it's just too fast. So, right, so, so now what we have is, the small quantum group, we have a quantum group with a big center, which has this representation theory. Then we have a VUA analog on for this, and we have G twisted modules. So again, we have a picture like this. 
But now that we have a third time picture like this, can we find a VUA that has all of this as representation category? That's not a big question. And to do this, I have to tell you some things that are unrelated to what I did before, um, namely the so-called generalized uh, quantum Langlands kernel. So this is a VUA construction. So basically what happens is as follows. So for every, for every integer, some divisibility, you can compute a family of vertex algebras that extends an affine Lie algebra and another affine Lie algebra at two levels which are related. So somehow this comes from the fact that I think the representation categories are equivalent and then you can sort of build, build this sort of object that represents this equivalence. So it's a big, big vertex algebra extending sort of v, V0 and V0. And you add sort of pairs of, of corresponding objects. And this is a big, big vertex algebra. And this vertex algebra is called geometric Langlands kernel. And what it is is a generalization of the so-called uh, algebra of Cairo differential operators, which is Akipov and Gatsgori, for n equals zero. So very loosely, I'm not very good at this, but very loosely, I think you should imagine um, how you decompose representations of a Lie group, right? You have this peter Wall theorem, and, and the, the, the ring of functions decomposes as a module like this, right? The two one-dimensional representations left and right, the two three-dimensionals, and so on. And, and this is somehow the same, but chiralized. For, for n equals zero. And now there's these versions where you have this shift or P where, where, where the, the levels are a lot of not, not, not uh, right, inverse to each other in some sense, but, but, uh, but shifted by something. And, and this is an algebra that, that uh, has appeared in, in, in 4D pictures. So people who studied uh, 40 to 2D correspondences in, in works by, by several, I put several names here, Kapustin Witten and Kreuzig Gajotto and Gerto Frankl, Fagin, Dimovti. And several others, so I have more complete references in the paper. Uh, let me also point out, because he's here, uh, Yuto Moriwaki has uh, constructed, for example, the existence of this algebra, I think in a very clever way, by going with kashtan lustig duality to the quantum group, the generic quantum group, and there you can do the construction much more easy and you can transport back. So somehow I think this is something we can, we can there is like this, 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 analogy of this algebra on the quantum group side, this time the generic semi-simple quantum group side, and you could do a lot of constructions there and then transport them back via these functors. So there is, I think, a very clever way of getting a touch onto this algebra, but of course it doesn't tell you much how it looks like. So it's, it just tells you the existence and then the, the multiplication and sort of things. So there yeah, several works, but several people to do this. Um, and what we now can also do is, so we have now this, this sort of two affine Lie algebras sitting inside. Oh, let me, by the way, say, as a Tomoyuki, talk about some 42D picture, and maybe this is related, but I have no clue why. <laughs> so maybe somebody can explain to me, but maybe not. Um, so, so this is, a priori, for me, it's not related, but of course it should be, yeah. So this is for, like, like general level, right? Yeah. Why are they called, like, terms? Can you say something about it? No, I think the word kernel, I'm not sure why. I think kernel, like, maybe integration kernel or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not kernel like in a sense of a, of a. So, um, so what we can also do now do in this decomposition, we can do a quantum Hamiltonian introduction on one side. We can do also on both sides, but let's stick with one side. So now we have affine Lie algebra on the left side and W algebra on the right side. And what I will use in now what I tell you is that in, in two specific cases, namely in the P equals one case and in the SL2 P equals two case, you have explicit realizations of these algebras. So there is certain, by accident, certain algebras that you can actually work with and prove stuff, which, which agree. So in the, this is a, the first case is like a, like a GQO coset construction. I think we have it on the blackboard a couple of days ago, um, which basically says that this, this algebra you get is a level K plus one affine Lie algebra and level one affine Lie algebra with the deformation of the energy momentum tensor. So this is what this URO means. So we have some, some different energy momentum tensor. And for SL2 P equals two, this uh, big algebra is like super Vera Soto algebra N equals four, and the reduction is always P12. So those are now random explicit vertex algebras that have this structure, are like this. And how do we get from this to, to big center now? So now we have to look at limits. So what we can do is when, whenever we have a vertex algebra that depends in a reasonable way on a parameter kappa, we can send this parameter to maybe to limit values, we can try whether this works. So for example, I can try to send it to infinity. So physically that somehow means going to the semi-classical limit. So I somehow remove the quantum mechanical effects. Um, and and uh, there's several choices because I have to sort of choose a basis with respect to the ring Z 
of kappa. I mean, I cannot just do this. I have to sort of choose a basis and then and then see what happens. And depends on the choices, really. So, so for a certain choice, when you do this for an affine Lie algebra, what happens is that the affine Lie algebra becomes commutative and it becomes uh, isomorphic to the ring of functions on the space of G connections. Um, namely, namely, how this goes basically is uh, so you have these elements a n and you have to rescale them by kappa. Um, and this a n over kappa uh, more or less corresponds, not as more or less, it does correspond to when you have your connection, you write something like this. And then, and then so this is a this is a this this is an element in G, right? And this is supposed to be a function on the set of d plus a's. And what it is, it, is, it picks out sort of the, the, end, the end coefficient. So it's really quite, quite direct. I mean, I mean, you have this large, large cumulative algebra, and you can sort of arrange that all these generators pick out coefficients of your expansion. So I have a, I have a connection, and, and uh, the set of the algebra of functions on all of these connections um, is this cumulative limit. And then you can do the same for, for the for the modules, oh, there is a lambda missing. No, no it's not missing. But for the for this affine vertex algebra, you just have regular connections because there is no no uh, sorry no uh, negative terms. That's what the regular connection is called, right? And it's just there's no pole in Z. And then if you look at some module, then what you get is basically also functions over these regular. I mean, it's clear, right? Because because what does it mean if if you if you say all a n n n larger than zero are zero that exactly translate to all the a n n larger equal zero are zero so i mean this is this is literally when you when you go from the lie algebra to the induced module where all the positive modes act by zero and all the negative modes don't that exactly translates to the fact that here the the coefficient with a positive n just vanish so that's what happens and if you do this with a module, then somehow you see again this ring of functions, but it's a bundle, and you see the, the fibers look like the finite dimension representation of this Lie algebra lambda. And you can also do this for the W algebra, but then you get stuff which is called an OPA, and either you know that or you don't. So okay. Um, but it's a reduction of it's sort of, sort of like the, the classical version of what you do when you do a Hamiltonian reduction, and you go from, from connections to, to, to OPAs. And so, so, so as soon as we go to this limit and we have all these little affine Lie algebras sitting inside and everything is modules over this affine Lie algebras, as soon as we go to this limit, um, everything becomes sort of bundles because it's modules over this ring of functions. So they become bundles over the space of connections. So once I do that, um, I, my, my category fibers over the set of all connections. But now we have to be careful. This is not the same as with commutative algebra. In commutative algebra, those are nice modules. But here they become twisted modules. And this has to do with the fact that this algebra is commutative, but it has a non-trivial braiding. So what you get is that your, your big center will contain the ring of functions on the connection, and your category will fiber now over the space of connections. But again, these three will be twisted modules. And of course, I can now try to play this game with this uh, quantum Langlands kernel. And if you just plug in the, the symbols that I put, so you know, you know where, where these modules go to, and the Ws just stay. And then you see this, and this exactly looks like the decomposition we had for this fagin Tibunin algebra. And in fact, it's a conjecture by Kreutzig and Nakazuka uh, that, that this is, in fact, the fagin Tibunin algebra. So here. So this makes quite a nice picture. And let me now, at this point, uh, summarize what we have. So that what we, pro what we propose is that there is sort of a G, a large G crossed tensor category. So I'm only talking about abelian in the following, but it should be G crossed, uh, G crossed category, which you can get in four different ways. You can get it as modules over the quantum group with a big center. Let me say the, the right version. I mean, we have, it's not completely clear what we exactly have to take here. We have to take a version of the quantum group with big center where there is a G cross printing. We can also just look at the small quantum group and look at all G crossed extensions. And, um, and by this uniqueness, this is very exciting, I think, but this uniqueness, somehow it's, it's, it's clear that, that, that this is sort of, it's almost unique what you get in this, in this blue bubble. Or I can go to the G twisted modules of the Fagin Tipolin algebra, which I calculated with this twisted repeat validations. Or I can go to the modules over this vertex algebra with a big center. So G 
G is a G group of G? Yes, G is the G group of small G. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Not the finite. No, 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 reductive proof. So that makes it difficult because we cannot use this result that I quoted, uh, but we should. <laughs> but so morally, it's there. Um, but, but we don't have it. But uh, this is part of the problems that we have. But we can now just start to calculate in little examples. And this is basically the rest of uh, what we did. Um, so, but, 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 but this is somehow, so, so if, I, if, 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 you would, if you would force me to prove this, right, the first thing is that you see here, there is hidden the Kastan lustig the logarithmic Kastan lustig correspondence, the zero fiber. So this has to be the same representation as this. But then there is here the G-cross extension and here the G-cross extension. And if we were to have this uniqueness results on extensions, the only thing we have to do is somehow compare co-associators and that is not so bad because we can check it on the free filterization. So it's some small computation. So that's not the problem. So as soon as we have this, so, so here actually there is a, an upgraded version of the Kastan lustig conjecture. Here there is something we should want to know about quantum groups anyhow. So this is independent of, Physics, right, or CFT, um, and and here's this rather rather weird guy that we get from this Langlands kernel, and and I think it's even a difficult problem to to check that the zero fiber of this, which you can compute, but that this is in fact a vacant tipo in algebra, and we can only see this in the small examples we compute that this is true, just by sometimes it's not even difficult to see, but but I have no clue how to prove this in general. So this is this conjecture. So this is, I think, the main the main message I wanted to get across. And at this time, yeah, we still have time. Well, wow. <laughs> uh, at this time, we, please. Can you say something about uh, possible? Can you say something about possible uh, existence of a uh, G cross braiding in this context? Uh, yes. So, so again, I mean, I mean, if you, so you mean in the example or from this unique unique? So I mean, the general, general picture. General picture. So the general picture from this from this. Uh, uh, I think of Nietzsche's Osterich correspondence is that that you get if there is some obstruction, there's some obstruction in, in H2 of G. Um, and if this obstruction is zero, then there exists a G cross extension and it's unique up to H3 of G. So, so there you have an existence result if the obstruction, this is not, I mean, an example is not so easy to compute, but in principle it's doable. It's cohomology of G, right? So cohomology of belief, what we know. And in these examples, um, so, so it depends on which, which picture you come from. So for example, here, uh, the, the G cross braiding is simply the braiding. So it is, it, you, have some, you have some intertwining operators that define the tensor product here. There is, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and here you have some intertwining operators and those are multi-valued functions and you simply continue one time around. And, no, but here, yes, so I, I would say, but we have this with, in some sense, much easier semi-simple cases that we, we, we know a category, we know that exists a G cross extension, but now we sort of want to find a model for it. I mean, this, this correspondence is rather difficult to work out in, 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 in practice. So to really see what the category looks like is very difficult. Um, and so, so for example, that's something with, with, with Cesar and Sven, what we, we think about in some cases, but for the latest few ways. But so, so you, so I, I, yeah, I would say, I would say what you would do is you would write this really down and, and, and believe that it has a braiding and then see it should restrict to this non-trivial associativity here and that should give, and then you can sort of go through this construction by Edmund Nietzsche Ostwick and see how, for example, the braiding of the trivial sector with the other sectors go. That's the first thing you do. You don't do the twisted sectors with each other. This is very complicated, but you start with the module category structure from both sides. And then it would piece by piece work up, but yeah, this is work. I mean, I'm not saying this is easy, but it should, I mean, so from the, from the VOA picture, we sort of believe it should be true. <laughs> so there should be the structure. And, uh, and then, as I said, in the examples, I would only talk about Abelian structure. That's difficult enough. Let's now look a little bit at examples. So as I said, there's two types of examples that we can handle. The, um, the one is very trivial. The second one is luckily not completely trivial, but uh, even the very trivial one I think is instructive. So we can prove an equivalence of these four guys as abelian categories in two cases. The first case is G simply lays and P is equal to one. Now everybody who does logarithmic Kashalustic conjecture now starts to laugh because P equals one means there is no small quantum group. It's sort of just UG. I mean, it's like the small quantum group at a first root of unity. So it's, it's boring in some sense, right? But nevertheless, it should be true in this case. Um, and so what you can do is you can work out the twisted modules of the affine Lie algebra. And because in this case, this, this action is inner, they are all equivalent as abelian categories. So that means all the fibers are equivalent. The Virasoro algebra changes. So the, the elements in here have a very different Virasoro action than the elements here. And the Virasoro, action is basically changed as you see by, 
by a n. So a is the element we, we twist it by. So it's basically changed by this mode operator a n. In particular, you get genre blocks and stuff like that. So this is a highly non-trivial guy. I will show you a picture later. So this is how this virtual direction is deformed. Now we do the same computation on the other side. So let's look, and in this case, we have a model for it. Let's look at this uh, big center vertex algebra and compute the zero fiber. We get as conjecture, the, just the affine algebra at level one, which is the fake anti algebra in this case. And then we have a sort of action is deformed in the following way. And maybe you have to look at this formula for a minute to see what it means. So now you have a connection like this. And now you add, so forget the quadratic term. So you add to LN terms a n prime prime so different contributions from this uh, connection and then the second this n prime here is the mode operator of this Lie algebra element so the first so the n, n prime prime tells you which of these guys to take and the n prime tells you which mode this is summable opposite so there's contributions from all of these guys and in particular if you if you say suppose that it's just a zero then you recover the formula from above so a zero means that this here is at the same sort of degree as this. So this gives you Jordan blocks and so on. If you have smaller a n, which means regular, so they have uh, positive set powers, then this just adds higher terms in the degree. So there's here sort of, sort of you, you act, but you get some higher contributions. But those are near potent. They don't really matter. So in some sense, you can transform them away. So somehow adding some regular connection deforms it, but it deforms it in a way that you can sort of reverse by base changes if you i mean it's tolerable but you can do like layer by layer you can you can reverse the project and and if if the if the singularity here is irregular so if there's a z minus two then this is completely terrible because this gives lower terms and of course if you look no uas if you start to add lower terms then 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 sort of things completely explode so this is very wild and this fits very well that of course the connection there's regular connections regular singular connections with a term like this and then it's irregular connections, with irregular singularity. And this is sort of the three cases that we have. So, so this is the result in this case. So the, the category is very, very easy. The Virasol is deformed. And we see at least, if you go back to the picture, you see, you see at least that also the Virasol action here and here fits, not just the category. Right? Let's now go to the second type of example, namely SL2 and P equals 2. So in this case, we know that the triplet algebra is called symplectic fermion. So that's one of the easiest VOAs you can have. So we have this VOA and we have an action of SL2 on it. So it's a well-posed question, what are the twisted modules? And you can work them out using work by Bakalov and, and, and Jin Wai Yang and so on. So they, they have technology where you can basically write down what happens, but you have to apply it a little bit. Um, and again, what we find is a deformed Peter Soro but now the, the categories will not be equivalent anymore. So first of all, let me show you a little bit how the Vida Soto deforms. This is very similar to the previous case. So you get additional contributions. So basically your Vida Soto changes to something like, uh, so LN plus A. This is plus quadratic term. So this is your Vida Soto. And what it does is, so, so for example here, usually you think that if you act with L1 is zero, but you have here additional contribution of L1 that goes here. And if you see here, L0, of course, goes to here, but you have an additional contribution that goes to here. So there's a Jordan block in L0. So, so somehow the whole picture gets additional contributions from left to the right, because that's the direction in which the neopotent element acts. And this picture looks maybe confusing, um, but what is, what is nice if you stare a long time on it, let me just add this as a remark, using the second step is to decompose the module over the fixed point VOA. So let's see what happens here. If you decompose it over the fixed point VOA, it means to take kernel of this action to the right. Then you see you have here this module, but if you act L minus one, it wants to be zero, but it ends up here. Then it's here the regular L minus two, which you always have. Then there is an L minus three, then there's an L minus four. So the kernel actually is a Verma module, the sort of Verma module. Usually these are Bakimoto modules, right? So they have an alternating decomposition period. But here you get a Verma module built up from these sort of pieces. So you deform it into something which contains the Verma module on the other side of the co Verma module. So that's actually a quite surprising structure to be found. Um, and I promised you I'll give you a picture how the categories look like in this case. So, so this is the picture how the category looks like. So here I draw badly <laughs> SL2. So SL2 contains conjugacy classes, for example, blue, black. So black is the unit 
more important elements are green and maybe a semi simple element is blue. So this is how, how SL2 looks like, maybe the conjugacy classes look like. And now how, are the, how do the three different types of fibers look like? So in the zero fiber, you find as the projective object, this matches exactly the projective object from UQSL2, right? In the semi-simple, this is something, of course, uh, Christian Blanchier knows from, from, from their work, uh, generically, it's semi-simple. So there's only one simple object. And in this, and in this uh, new potent cases, which are usually not considered, so um, here's just a shift in the Vinasoro conformal weight. But here you get these new this donor blocks, and you get basically a two-dimensional module, which is extended by another two-dimensional module. So this is an indecomposable. So this is how this category looks like. And if you work out the presentation theory of the quantum group of big center, this is exactly the picture you get. And it's actually quite nice in this example. So I could draw the same picture and put here elements of the small quantum group. Because in this case, only in this case, actually the deformed relation that you get um, when you deform it, are just the same as the quantum group. So you literally find the quantum group as the zero mode algebra. In the other cases, it's not so easy. In the other case, just the category is a good. But here you can really see that it's the same elements. And I give you here, now on the other hand, if we start with this big center quantum group, um, some connection, you see how the, how the mode algebra deforms using this connection. And it, in fact, it deforms in a way that if you commute with L minus one, that you exactly see how the connection appears. So, and from this, you can, you can do more experiments, right? You can not just deform by a group element, you can perform by a regular connection or even by one of these very weird irregular guys. And I did this for fun, but I don't know what the result means, but I can compute. So this is how the mode algebra generates. So if you plug in a zero connection, you get the mode algebra for symplectic fermions, but it's deformed in a way that you can really work with and you can check what the representations are. So that's maybe a point to recap and, and see what our, so, so basically, this is just empirical, right? I mean, you have this big picture that you somehow hope for, and then you just look in the abelian categories of, of, of two rather simple cases. And you just calculate everything through and, and, and check what happens. And we find that it works. But now there are several conceptual questions, which maybe I, I want to ask your opinion about. Uh, and, and I'm happy with any comment that, that I get on any of these. Let's go through them uh, a little bit. So first of all, of course, the, the question uh, that we are still not happy with <laughs> There's still a long way to go. Proof really that this is an equivalence of G cross categories. So with tensor structure and for every G and P, that would of course be nice to see that this picture really holds. This is the extension of this logarithmic Kachandowski conjecture. So this would be nice. And then as a second bullet, I put, we would, it would be not trivial, but, but it would reduce our problems greatly if you would have this adding of Nietzsche's Ostrich uniqueness in the case where G is a Lie group and C is non semi simple. And the model it should hold, but uh, maybe Dimitri knows better. Uh, so model it should hold maybe, but but I don't know what it does. And this would of course help. Huh? Sorry? It should hold in general, but I don't have a paper where this is written. I would be very happy to see a paper where this is written. Yeah. yeah, we can talk about it. So, so it should hold, right? Also, um, the, you see from the connection, so there should be an infinitesimal version of this because now you have a Lie group. So it would be very interesting to see this correspondence how it looks like an infinitesimal version. So what I mean with this is, so there should be, whenever there's a Lie group acting on a category, then there should be from the Lie algebra, there should be a map, again, this, this Eno map. So there should be a unique up to a three co-cycle map that gives me for an element in the Lie algebra an element in the deformations of C as a bimodule category and with braiding and so on. And as I, as I understand, uh, Ganod enough and inspired and so on, developing at the moment machinery that one would need to address this question. But but if you if you look down how this how this G cross extensions are constructed, there should be a, the map should be essentially unique, like a linearization of this procedure. And we will see this linearization on this connection part because this is also infinitesimal, right? Um, but then also, of course, you can ask not just for a triplet, but before we did the Hamiltonian reduction, so like a a non-reduced version of the whole thing could also be interesting. And then the, the, other, the other conceptual thing, which I have sort of problems for myself understanding is, so, so far nobody asked. I thought, I thought somebody would somebody interrupt me and ask. So on the one side of the correspondence, we had a category graded by a connection. And on the other side, we had a category graded by the group. This is not the same. I compared everything and everything matches, but in fact, the, the basic data does not match, right? I compare apples with pies, I think, uh, peers. Uh, so, so of course, the, the, the correspondence is that, that here you have a Z minus one term, so you only look at this case. You, you exclude wild singularities, and so you look at this case, and then if you look at the monogamy of this around zero, then you go here. 
but that still leaves something conceptually open. Because in fact, what we get in our examples and, and it should get in all cases is, um, we should get twisted modules, not twisted by group element, but by connection. And if you read Fainted Ben Zwi carefully at the certain chapters, you see that they basically propose that this exists, but there, nobody wrote down, I don't know, Jacobi identity or something like that in these cases. It's just like an abstract algebraic geometry construction. But there should be a notion like that. And if you know anything about this, I would be very happy. Um, I, I think you basically know how it should look in the examples, but, but there should be some notion. And then there should be like a, a cross category uh, labeled by these objects, right? I mean, we have one, <laughs> so there should be a notion like this, right? Um, and then what do these two things that separate these two things, what do they mean? So for example, here I have higher terms but they are all the same up to coordinate transformations. Here they are all the same. So somehow that's what I showed you. There's many, many modules here for different connections. They all look a little bit different, but you can trivialize this. So those are deformations, but you can sort of trivialize it away. So what kind of structure is that? So somehow there's big equivalence classes in this, let me call it D plus A cross category. There's sort of big equivalence classes related by group elements, but, but they're not all the same, right? They are different, but they are isomorphic. And on the other hand, what it happens with irregular singularities. So I computed one example. It's like, it's like if this is the G cross category, it's like here. <laughs> I mean, what, what is it? And then there is some analytic applications that originally I think Boris had in mind, for example, is computing Nikolasov partition functions, which is the examples that he had in mind. And then there is connections if you look at the analysis to isomonodromic deformations. So there's a work by uh, Lisa Voy, Gavrilenko, Teshna, and so on. Um, so a specific analytic application where, where it has to do with this categorical stuff which we do and also dynamic conditioning solomagic of equations. Yes, so those were the, all the different loose ends. So I started with few loose ends and end with very many, but uh, thanks for the attention. Can you explain a little bit more how I can no. <laughs> um, so so this is originally where this comes from, if you ask Boris. Um so so what happens is um you, you want to con compute four-dimensional correlation functions and more or less in the four-dimensional picture, you can reduce this to stuff you ask about a manifold, the manif incidental manifold, right? And this, this manifold is, for example, in, in the easiest case is something like, uh, where's the chalk? Uh, in the easiest case is maybe something like C2 over Zn or something like that. So this is the, the manifold of incidents. And now you can compute the partition function of this and, and see it looks like a correlation functions of a CFT. And in fact, that's that's how they how they, started looking at the CFT. So I forgot exactly what the bijection is, but like N corresponds to P, I think, or I mean, something like that. I mean, you have different modular spaces and the partition function that belongs to this, the Nicolaitan partition function is the, the, the correlation functions that you get for these, uh, for these uh, quantum Langlands. This example we study with uh, about QSL2 with the center. We are extending uh, G cross braiding to autonomic braiding web the two objects uh, are exchanged by a black counter. Can you write on your picture? Is it slightly more general? So, so I'm not sure. So I, 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 so actually I'm from the quantum group side. So that should be the first thing I thought about. It was not. <laughs> so so, um, so my, my first intuition, but I'm not sure if that's wrong. My first intuition would be the same thing. And I know Cody has papers on that. The first time where this happened was already for the small quantum group. And for the small quantum group, this happens if you don't use an associator appropriately. So I can imagine, but this is now careful. I can imagine if you do the right associator, which you have to do because you want the fiber to be with associator, right? So if you use the right associator, then it should it should disappear and you get an honest G cross braiding. But whether this does or not, uh, I didn't do. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, we don't. You also think, yeah, I think. Just to make sure I understand the structure of like what happened in this part of the talk. Uh, so you don't know the existence of the fake into Poonin algebras. You. Is that right? You don't yeah. know the, the existence of those, like as VOAs or something, these extensions? That's what you, I asked you this question. Well, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Are you, I, 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 at least not with the properties we want them to have. Yeah. Okay. But you do know the existence of the geometric Langlands kernel. Yes. So you can take its DS reduction, mm -hmm. take the large kappa limit. Exactly. And it has a center that's at least the size of functions on connections on the mm -hmm. full disk. And you can specialize at zero. Yeah. You can specialize at the central character. Exactly. And that gives you some candidate for this guy. Yes. yes and then yes. the claim is that in those examples that you said, there you can actually check that this this quotient is exactly. isomorphic to the thing. Very, very well. Thank you. That's right. exactly the point. Yeah. But what's wrong with the other? Like, does, does this not, for example, just give you a construction of the algebras you want? You can't 
kind of use this? To... That's my question. Let, let, let me say, that, but, but the point is that that's a bit the problem on, on, on how to prove this very people in algebra. So you have several constructions. I mean, you have, this is new, you're right. I mean, this would be a, a new a new approach to try. There is also this construction which Sugimoto worked on, which was in Fagin Tipunin's original paper, where you sort of build a bundle over the flat variety and take the whole cohomology of this. This also gives you a candidate for the Fagin Tipunin algebra. And then there is this kernel of screenings, which I mean, you can write down. I can say, consider the subspace kernel of screenings. It's even a VUA, I can prove it. Um, but but then, sort of, first of all, it's not clear that these three things agree, and it's not clear. The difference he proved, oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. for, for example, then, then, then there was this paper, which I mentioned, where they proved that these two definitions are the same. And then from one of them, you get the characters, because you have this other characteristic formula, you can get the, the characters. From the other one, so for example, Adama, which Miller proved, proved how the irreducibles look like just by, by, by looking at the dual algebra, which is sort of hard work. Um, I don't know if that follows from this other picture again. So, so somehow the problem is more or less you have like different constructions and they should all be isomorphic and each of them gives some properties more or less for free. And 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 yeah, that's a little bit the, the problem. So that's why I say we know the existence, but not the existence with the properties we want. I mean, maybe we can write something down.